Hello and welcome to the first of a series of lectures designed to walk you through the BSc's Level 1 accreditation process. Throughout these lectures we're going to look at the various components of the curriculum and we're going to start off by introducing the idea of focused echocardiography and what a Level 1 scan means to us. Now if you're interested in pursuing the Level 1 accreditation then the first place to start is with the accreditation pack and you can find this on bsecho.org, the BSc's website. Go to the website, go to the accreditation page and there you can find two important downloads, the Level 1 Accreditation Pack and the Level 1 Minimum Dataset. The Accreditation Pack contains all the information you need to get started, it outlines the important messages within the curriculum, and it explains how the accreditation process works, including the logbook component and the practical examination. So when we're referring to Focused Echo, what is it that we're talking about? So to be clear, we're not talking about substandard scans performed by people who haven't had training. The focused echo is usually performed by the healthcare professional who is responsible for caring for the patient. And that professional will have other responsibilities other than simply performing cardiac ultrasound. As such, it's essential that the focused echo can be performed rapidly as a protracted scan will take away from other components of patient care. In addition to learning how to acquire and interpret images, the student of focused echo needs to recognise the limitations of a focused scan, the limitations of their own experience, and when it's necessary to refer onwards to a more experienced practitioner. Focused echo should not be considered as an abbreviated comprehensive scan, but rather a different test performed by different individuals in different patient populations. The purpose of a focused scan is to identify immediately life-threatening pathologies which will have an impact on immediate patient management. In many respects, focused echocardiography could be more difficult to perform than a comprehensive study. Point of care ultrasound is performed where the patient is being treated, and this can be anywhere from pre hospital to the emergency department to the hospital ward or intensive care unit. It may not be possible to change a patient's position. There may be wounds or dressings that limit access to the chest. The patient may be receiving positive pressure ventilation, that means that aerated lungs get in the way of the view. And you may not be the only individual attending to the patient, and you may have to work around colleagues who are also performing important tasks. Okay, so if we're going to perform an echo, we're going to require a phased array probe. So this is a standard phased array probe. We have the footprint, which is where a grid of piezoelectric crystals are housed. And behind that we have the body, which is where we're going to hold on to the probe. On one side of the probe we have an orientation marker. And this lets us know which side of the probe lines up with the right-hand side of the sector as displayed on our screen. When you're learning echocardiography, your instructors will need to be able to explain to you how to manipulate the probe in order to achieve better images. Perhaps surprisingly, there's no universally accepted, standardised way of describing how we move a probe. But for in these videos, I'm going to use the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine's descriptors, as published in the 1999 Journal of Ultrasound Medicine. First up, we're going to have sliding. Sliding is the only manipulation of the probe in which the probe's footprint moves where it's touching the patient and we're going to advise you to either slide the probe superiorly, inferiorly, laterally or medially. Secondly, we have rotation. Rotation is around the central axis of the probe and will either be clockwise or anti-clockwise. Third, we have rocking. Rocking is parallel to the orientation marker and will cause the image within our sector to swing. As an example, this is the sort of motion that you'll require in order to centralise the septum in the apical four-chamber view. The final probe manipulation we're going to talk about is tilting. This is a movement of a probe perpendicular to the orientation marker and allows you to see in different planes. Tilting would be the manipulation required to move laterally down the left ventricle from the mitral valve to the perineal muscles to the apex in the parasternal short axis view. So to summarise we have four main probe manipulations. Sliding, rotation, rocking and tilting. And when manipulating the probe, it's advisable to just use one manipulation at a time, especially when you're first starting out. Alright, so now that we've been introduced to our face array probe, we know how to manipulate it, let's start performing our first scan. So I'm going to walk you through the BSC's minimum data set for a level 1 scan. And this has got 18 key views and measurements. So let's start by applying a 3-lead ECG to our patient and getting them in the optimal position. And if you can lay your patient in the left lateral, that's great. Of course, we appreciate that's not always possible. So we're going to start with a parasternal long axis view. We're going to start with a deep parasternal long axis view to assess the pericardial and pleural effusions. So place your probe somewhere around about the third or fourth intercostal space just left of the sternum, 
with the orientation marker pointing towards the patient's right shoulder. This is your starting position, you're going to have to manipulate your probe in order to get a true parastatal long axis. Identify the descending aorta in short axis sitting just below the left atrium. And this is a really key landmark, because pericardial fluid between the parietal and visceral pericardium will track between the descending aorta and the left atrium, whereas pleural fluid will track behind the descending aorta. An optimal deep parastatal long axis should have the heart occupy about 50% of the image with the focus point positioned at the level of the pericardium. Remember, as well as looking posterior to the heart for pericardial fluid, look anterior to the right ventricle in the near field. Now we'll decrease our depth and bring our focus marker up to the level of the aortic valve in order to do our second view, the parastatal long axis cardiac focused view. So let's quickly revise which structures are visible now. So we have a left atrium in the bottom right hand corner, which opens through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. And sitting directly anterior to the mitral valve is the aortic valve that opens into the aortic root and proximal aorta. The most anterior cardiac structure we can see is part of a right ventricle, that's a right ventricle outflow tract. So what do we need to assess in a parastatal long axis view? We need to look at the LV. Consider the LV cavity size. And what we're really interested in is the internal diameter at end diastole. And in a second we're going to measure this. We're going to look at the LV walls and look at the thickening of the walls. And what we want to see is that the walls thicken and move towards the centre of the cavity during systole. We're going to look at the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and look at the thickness of the leaflets. Do the valves open when they should, and do they close and meet in the middle, without falling back into the preceding chamber? Visually inspect the aortic root, and does it appear dilated? In general, the right ventricular outflow tract, aortic root and left atrium should all be roughly the same sort of size. There are plenty of pathologies which can cause these structures to dilate, but very few that cause them to get smaller. And so a general tip is that if one of these three or two of these three are larger than the others, then it's likely that the large one is the one that's got the abnormality. Okay, next up we're going to make a measurement of the LV cavity size. And what we really want to know is the LV internal diameter at end diastole. And you can do this either using M mode, as I'm doing here, or using a frozen 2D image. So using M mode, you're going to line your cursor up through the LV walls, ensuring that they're perpendicular to the LV walls. If you're cutting obliquely through the cavity, you're going to overestimate your cavity dimension. And the cursor should rest just beyond the tips of the mitral valve leaflets when the mitral valve is open. Okay, and in our MO clip, we're going to use the ECG to make sure we know which phase of the cardiac cycle we're looking at at any given moment. I'm going to identify end diastole, which is just around about the level of the QRS complex, just beyond the level of the QRS complex here. And you can see that following the QRS complex, the intraventricular septum, which is about halfway down the M-mode image, and the infralateral wall of the LV both move towards the centre of the cavity as they thicken, as we'd expect. We're going to measure the internal diameter, making sure we ignore any subvalvular apparatus, any chordae that may be passing through this area. If we stop our measurement short because we've stopped at a chordae, we'll end up underestimating our cavity diameter. And here we can see the normal reference ranges for both adult male and females. We've got a measurement here of 44mm, which is well within the normal range for our female model. OK, now we're going to use colour flow mapping for the first time. So we're going to create a colour box, and we're going to place this over our aortic valve, and extending over the left ventricular outflow tract, which is where any regurgitation will appear. So this box needs to be big enough so that the valve leaflets are within the box at all times, and the box needs to extend into the LV cavity ensuring that if there is any regurgitation it never leaves the box. So if you've got a regurgitant jet and it's extending beyond the limits of your box you need to make your box bigger so we can see just how big that regurgitant jet is. Once you have your box nicely centred over the valve and outflow tract, pan through the valve, that is tilt through the valve so that it disappears in one extreme and then tilt all the way back so it disappears in the other extreme. If you have a regurgitant jet that's outside of the centre, if you don't pan through the valve you may miss it. Once we're happy there's no regurgitation, or we've evaluated any regurgitation that does exist, and we're happy that there's no turbulent flow within the outflow tract, we're going to move our colour box down to cover the mitral valve leaflets and left atrium, and look for any regurgitation here. And just as we did previously, we're going to pan through the valve, we're going to tilt the body of the probe in one direction, all the way until the valve leaflets disappear, and then we're going to tilt the body of the probe back in the other direction, passing through the valve, until the valve disappears in the other direction. With mitral regurgitation in particular, it's very easy to miss a regurgitant jet if its origin is away from the centre of the valve leaflets. 
OK, now we've finished with the power standard long axis views, we're going to move to the power standard short axis. So keeping the footprint of the probe in the same position, we're now going to rotate the probe through its central axis approximately 90 degrees, such that the orientation marker is now pointing to somewhere between the left midclavicular line and left shoulder. Now whatever was in the centre of your image as you started to rotate will remain in the centre of the image, and so a neat trick here is to place the aortic valve directly in the middle of the view in the parasternal long axis, rotate around the aortic valve, and that will take us straight to the parasternal short axis at the level of the great vessels. So let's consider the anatomy now on view. So in the centre of the image we have the aortic valve with its three cusps clearly seen. Anterior to the aortic valve we have the right ventricular outflow tract, with a tricuspid valve on the left of the image and a pulmonary valve on the right. And in the far field we have the left atrium. As we're cutting through the aortic valve, we're medial to the left ventricle, and so the left ventricle shouldn't be on show. What do we need to assess here? Well, we can look at the aortic valve leaflets, check their thickness and motion, make sure they're opening nicely, and we can look at the diameter of the right ventricular outflow tract. And whilst we're not going to measure this, it may be obvious that the right ventricle is dilated. In addition, we can get a sense of the right ventricular radial contractility here, and we want to see that the aortic valve annulus is moving up towards the right ventricular free wall. When we have very severe right ventricular failure, the distance between the right ventricular free wall and the aortic valve will remain static throughout the cardiac cycle. Now we're going to start to tilt our body of our probe so that our sector sweeps laterally and we're going to move down from the aortic valve to the mitral valve. Here we're going to inspect the valve leaflets, the anterior mitral valve leaflet in the near field and the posterior mitral valve leaflet in the far field, again looking at thickness and motion. And now we can see the ring of the left ventricle. And these are our basal segments. From here, continue to tilt your probe till we reach the mid-papillary muscle level. And here we can see the posterior medial papillary muscle in the far field, and to the right of the image, the anterolateral papillary muscle. This is a useful view for assessing regional wall motion abnormalities, as all three of our main coronary arteries will be represented here. Finally, we continue to tilt the body of the probe until we reach the apex, once more assessing left ventricular wall thickness, thickening and motion. OK, so next up we're going to switch windows and we're going to switch to the apical window. If possible, we're going to leave our patient lying in the left lateral position and we're going to place a probe over the apex of the heart with the orientation marker pointing towards the patient's left. Of course, the apex of the heart is in a different position in each patient and so you may need to slide the probe around to find the true apex. Once you've found the apex, place the apex of the left ventricle in the centre of the image with the intraventricular septum running straight down the image. So once we have our image, what anatomy is on view? Well, our right heart is on the left of the image as we look at it, and the left heart is on the right. We have the near field, we have the ventricles, and then as we move towards the far field, we have the AV valves, and behind them the atria. A correctly orientated apical four-chamber view won't have the aortic valve in view, as we should be looking posterior to this. If you can see the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve, lift the body of the probe up to find the mitral valve. The sector width should be set to include as much of the left and right ventricle as possible, and we set the depth so that none of the atria is cut off. Personally, I like to put the focus point level with the basal segments of the left ventricle. So let's consider what assessments need to be made here. So once again, we look at the left ventricle, we assess its size and contractility. We have a look at the right ventricle size and contractility, and specifically the long axis function. And we quantify the long axis function with the TAPSI measurement, which we'll show you how to do in a second. And we can see the mitral valve again here, and we should once again consider the motion of the mitral valve leaflets. Ensure that they open adequately, and that in systole when they close, they don't prolapse or flail back into the left atrium. Sticking with the mitral valve, let's create a colour box, and place this over the mitral valve leaflets and left atrium. And here we're looking for regurgitant flow occurring during systole. The box should cover all of the mitral valve leaflets, especially when they're closed. And if there is any regurgitation, it should cover all of the left atrium to make sure that there's no jet extending beyond the limits of the box.
From here, move the colour box over to the right heart and place it over the tricuspid valve and the right atrium in order to look for evidence of tricuspid regurgitation. So in a later lecture in this series we're going to cover how to assess the ventricular size and function in more detail. But one of the key measurements we're going to need to make if we're going to assess the right ventricle is the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Put more plainly, this is how laterally does the tricuspid annulus get pulled towards the apex of the heart during systole. Now the best way to measure this is to zoom in on the tricuspid lateral annulus and place the cursor through the annulus and then create an MMO graph. Once you've generated your MMO graph, try and identify one line that you feel best represents the tricuspid lateral annulus and follow that line so it moves up towards the near field during systole and then pushes back away from the near field during ventricular filling in diastole. And the value we want is the y-axis value from the trough all the way up to the peak. And it doesn't matter where you place your cursor on the x-axis, the software will automatically calculate the y-axis value for you. So here in our model we've got a, a TAPSI measurement of 28 millimetres, which is far in excess of the lower limit of reference range, which is 17 millimetres. So clearly normal. So without moving our probe, we're going to go back to our apical 4 chamber view, and we're going to convert this into an apical 5 chamber view. So this involves tilting the probe so that we can see more anteriorly in the chest. So tilting the probe by lowering the body. And this will reveal the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve, sitting anterior to the mitral valve. So while we're here, we'll have a look at the aortic valve, of course. But our principal reason for obtaining this view is so that we can put a colour box over the aortic valve and left ventricular outflow tract. And here we're looking for turbulent flow within the outflow tract and regurgitation back into the left ventricle. So we're going to create a colour box that sits over valve leaflets and extends towards the near field up into the left ventricle. Our third and final window in on the heart is looking from the subcostal position. So here we need our patient to be lying supine with the probe placed just below the zipper sternum with the orientation marker towards the patient's left. As the heart is in the anterior chest, ensure that you're holding the body of the probe entirely from above, otherwise you probably won't be able to get it flat enough. As you look up through the liver, the view of the heart is very similar to an apical four chamber view, rotated at about 45 degrees. So now our right heart is in the near field, lying on top of the liver, and our left heart is in the far field. So by the time we get around to looking at the heart through the subcostal window, we may well have already seen it well through the apical and parasternal windows. And we may well have already formed a clear idea in our mind about the size and the function of the left and right ventricles. In which case, this view may just simply corroborate what we've already decided. But there are a few patients in which this view is particularly useful, so patients who are in cardiac arrest, when the only opportunity to get a glimpse of the heart is in the 10 second pulse check, this is probably going to be your first choice view because it stays out of the way of the people doing CPR. And patients with hyperexpanded lung fields, so patients with COPD, patients with exacerbations of asthma, and anyone who's on positive pressure ventilation, may well have lungs that are hyperinflated, get in front of the heart in the parasternal and apical windows, but produce quite good subcostal views. In a comprehensive study, this will be where we'd measure the RV wall thickness. And whilst you won't be doing this in a focus scan, this is probably where you'll get the best impression of right ventricular hypertrophy if it's present. Next, we're going to try and identify the inferior vena cava running into the right atrium. So you're going to lift the body of a probe and rotate anti-clockwise 90 degrees, such that the orientation marker is pointing straight towards the head. And by tilting the probe, such the imaging sector goes slightly towards the patient's right-hand side. And here you can see we've identified the IVC running through the liver into the right atrium on the bottom right-hand side of the image. We can also see the confluence of the hepatic veins inserting into the IVC. Now, under certain conditions, measuring the IVC's diameter and measuring its collapsibility throughout the respiratory cycle can be useful for estimating fluid responsiveness, and I intend to go into this in a lot more detail in a dedicated lecture later on in this series. So how are we going to measure our IVC? So we're going to either do this in the 2D view or in an M-mode image. So let's show how we're going to do this in 2D. So we're going to freeze our image. We're going to find the point in time in which we have a maximum diameter, and we're going to measure at 90 degrees to the IVC walls, 2 centimetres below the IVC and RA junction. The 18th and final measurement we're going to make for our BSC Level 1 minimum data set is the IVC M mode. So now we're going to place our cursor through the IVC and capture an M mode graph of that. And you can see how 
If we were to measure the IVC diameter here, we would overestimate as we're cutting through the IVC obliquely. OK, so that completes our 18 standard views and measurements. So let's just quickly recap those. So we're going to start with the parasternal long axis. We're going to record a deep view to look for effusions. So we're going to come in and get a cardiac focused view. They're going to measure the diameter of the left ventricle and put color over the aortic valve and mitral valve. We're going to rotate the probe approximately 90 degrees clockwise, get our parasternal short axis view, and here we're going to take four levels of the level of the aortic valve, the level of the mitral valve, the level of the mid papillary muscles, and then finally the apex. We're going to pick our probe up and place it on the apex of the heart with the orientation marker towards the patient's left, and we're going to get an apical four chamber view. We're going to put some colour over the mitral and tricuspid valves and then measure the tapsy. We'll then tilt the body of a probe such that we see anterior structures including the aortic valve, and that gives us our five chamber view. And we're going to put colour over the left ventricular out of the tract and aortic valve. Once more, we're going to move our probe, now we're going to place it below the zipper sternum, orientation marker towards the patient's left, and we're going to get our subcostal four chamber view, and then we're going to rotate 90 degrees anticlockwise, such that we get a IVC view, a dedicated IVC view, and then do M mode through the IVC. Okay, and so all that remains is for me to thank you for watching, and in our next video lecture we're going to cover some of the physics of ultrasound, and how an understanding of that physics can help us optimise our images.